Hello, 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 Mr. Miller. Zach, Zach Hi, <laughs> how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fairly good. Thank you so much for joining me. Is it raining over your way today? No, it's sunny and a little windy. All right, we'll send that over our way. It's like perf yeah, <laughs> perfect it weather. Come. As they say, great for ducks, but yep. only the nice ones. Um, <laughs> tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Zach Mil or Zachary Miller. I'm currently living in Wapella, Saskatchewan, and I am a wildland firefighter. But that's not really the reason why I'm on your show today, or podcast, if you want to call it. Uh, I found is I've done a lot of work with different... Uh, just coming up with an internet issue here, just give me a second. Sure. Okay, well, that's fixed. But anywho, uh, the reason I'm on your show today is I do a lot of work with different police organizations, child and mental health organizations, and advocacy groups. And how I got into that is I had a very unfortunate childhood that I wouldn't wish upon many people. And I decided instead of doing, well, I was given basically two choices. I could hide away from it and, you know, kind of fall in on myself and pity myself, or I could get up and deal with it. And I ended up getting up and dealing with it. And I put a lot of time to working and helping others. Well, yes, and your, your story right. was very traumatic. It was very publicized. Um, yep. And what I, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was life after trauma. Um, of course, like so much respect for you and what you do. It's not easy uh, to, to just to have, like, have that personal decision. What do I, this happened to me. I can't change that. What do I do with it? Um, and yeah. I think for, for individuals who take that and then go forward with their life in a way where you spin it and you're, you kind of de dedicate yourself to helping others and prevention and awareness, education. And so thank you so much for that. <laughs> yeah. um, Something I can do. Exactly. And I wanted to to talk about, because this is a word I talk about a lot often, is being trauma-informed. To you, what does that word mean? Trauma-informed, well, that is an understanding of what someone has done or has gone through, and understanding how that has an impact on them and the people around them in their life. Now, for a lot of people in Canada and the United States and whatnot, they don't experience uh, large trauma events. But for the few who do, it can the trauma itself is actually afterwards, after what happened to them, is dealing with it afterwards. It's, I call it the shining light theory. So basically, in my case, I was kidnapped and sexually assaulted and had all sorts of lovely things done to me. But I always say after, you know, after I was found and you know, all the shining light saying he's found, he's safe, you know, it's all over. That's when the real struggles start that's when the real issues start coming up is how do you deal with it afterwards there's no how-to book there's nothing you can really find on it and there's not a lot of people out there who've gone through it so what do you do and I've struggled a lot with people trying to understand that because people do one of two things they're either over sympathetic or they're rude to you because they don't know how to deal with that kind of a person in that kind of situation. Like, how do you deal with a child who just went through a terrible summer? Like what happened to me? So trying to get people to understand the trauma and what, you know, you experience through it and how to deal with it is a real difficult thing. And what... Why comp what because for at least for me, like I compartmentalize, and so there's different areas or components of life that I find, uh, where if there were was more trauma informed care or mental health awareness or whatever you we want to call it, it would make not that anything could make life easy because you know, I think for a lot of us who have experienced trauma and traumatic events, and then then therefore you have PTSD and these other symptoms that can come from it. 
um, life can be difficult and life is not always designed or built, whether that's within families, within workplaces, within the medical system, like the issue of self-advocacy can be applied to many, many things. So when, when you, you think about trauma-informed and your personal experiences, what are some areas of life where it was just particularly difficult? Because I know, for example, one thing you had mentioned was going back to school and the bullying you faced. Yeah, well, there's been a few points in my life where I've had a lot of issues, especially dealing with what I went through. Yet yeah, for once, it was like you said, at school, I had a real hard time at school. So after everything happened to me, after I was found, I was given about two weeks to, you know, get the better sticker, get a stamp on your forehead and sent right back to school. And I was viciously bullied at school. I was called all sorts of different gay slurs. Kids were making fun of my younger sister, stuff like that. And when you're in grade five, so you're what, nine, 10, 11 years old, you don't learn those things. Well, you don't know those things. You learn those kind of things from your parents or from your grandparents or from your teachers. And that's where it was really difficult. And like, I would come home just completely broken after a day of school because everyone from the teachers to students to people's parents were just, they didn't know how to deal with my situation or how to deal with someone who's gone through that. So they tried to push me away so they wouldn't have to deal with it. And then I've also found a lot of issues with dating and stuff like that with a lot of similar issues. So I always like to try and keep my story close to me unless I'm, if I'm working with that, it's a little bit different, but when I'm at work or whatnot, I try and keep that story away from me because once people find out about it, it shifts their view on me. And then it can be very difficult, especially in the workplace or dating. And I've been stood up on dates. Once people decide to Google my name and I'll send boom, that all pops up. They don't know what to do. So all of a sudden they got a family emergency and I never hear from them again had that more times than I can count and it's the same with work is I I go from just being like your average person you know working just fine to all of a sudden people are don't know or uncomfortable being around me don't know how to deal with things and all of a sudden like jokes and stuff like become very tense and awkward and that's just something that gets very hard to deal with and was this something that you considered because for the longest time, your name was under a publication ban. So yes. no one knew who like you were, your name was whatever. And then well, you, yo, oh, sorry, go on. So with the publication ban, it was put in to protect my name, but you could go and Google search me because of the Amber Alert and whatnot was issued. My name is out there with all the stories. Okay. And the only thing is after the publication bans, I couldn't use my own name and to reference with my story. So after the publication ban, new stories couldn't use my name or court or for media uses and stuff like that. But then it also affected me on a personal level because once I was ready to actually share my story and start raising awareness for everything, especially for victims' rights and stuff like that, I couldn't use my own name to my own story till I had to get my publication ban lifted. And that was a three-year struggle in court trying to get my name back. Because there's no point in having story if you can't use your name. Mm -hmm. And so, and when you were, so during this three-year period and you're, you know, working to get your name back and everything, was this something you considered would happen? Like the dating and then workplace and people and Googling your name and, and then what that would look like for you? Like, was that so, something you considered in the beginning? That was already happening before that. Okay. So it wasn't really... It wouldn't change anything. But the biggest thing about media coverage is it's double-edged sword. Yes, it can help improve things and help bring more awareness to people, help, you know, broadcast my voice to a larger audience. But in the end, it can also hurt me. It can bring, you know, negative feedback. And like, I've had issues with, you know, predators sending letters when I was younger and stuff like that. But that was a whole different fucking bag of cats. And you, yeah, I have heard you talk about as well, you know, you would do these interviews and these media things and the headlines, because you were talking about double-edged sword, then you, you talked about the headlines they would use and how it, it, it's, it kind of shows, I think, a larger issue in how, first of all, how victims are treated. Yeah. Um, and even, even though people are like, no, it's like the best intention, you were here to like empower, whatever. But I think 
your comment on the on the headlines that were used, which were kind of like going against your entire mission. Yeah, that would have been a news article with the CBC. And I'm not a very big fan of the CBC anymore, just dealing with them personally, but they refer to me as a sex slave. Yeah. Multiple things. And I was not overly happy about that, but that is what it is. So. And, and I, you know, I'm on the same, I guess, sentiment as you, because you had talked about there, there, okay, I guess hustle culture right now and how everything's about clicks and how do you get people to click and everything like that. But in doing so, we forget like the humanity of it. Yeah. <laughs> And so, so very, very important. Um, what are, when you, when, just jumping back to uh, life after the event and the different areas, things you observed, um, what were some things that stand out to you that, that would have just made things easier? Well, for it all not to have happened, that would have been the easiest. But <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, that never can happen or could have happened. But some things that could have made a life a lot easier is like small town stigma and everything that kind of goes in with, especially not to discriminate against any female sexual assault survivors or anything like that, but to go against the male survivors because, you know, that's not something you always hear a lot of is males who've been sexually assaulted and whatnot and what it's like to go through because there's a big stigma at that. That's usually like biggest thing I've dealt with in small communities even larger cities clicks is being that you know that's related to homosexuality and stuff like that and when it really isn't I was a child at the time and that person that I don't even want to call him a person it's an excuse of a piece of skin was sexually attracted to me because I was a child and that's where the biggest thing is with all this and it's something that's really hard to kind of break that stigma and it's not only, it's the same thing with especially female survivors saying that they wanted it, you know, they dressed like that. It's the same thing. And that's like, that's one of the biggest struggles with that. And then the understanding of it. Uh, I said, I was bullied a lot by children who heard that from their parents. because so they didn't know what to do. So they kind of just put this all up. Like if we be mean to him, he won't come near us kind of thing. And like a better understanding of victims and how they feel and how, you know, how terrible of a life they have and the smallest thing can make the world's biggest difference. Because there's been times where I've been at a real bad low point and the one kind person said something nice to me. And, you know, that saved me from fucking going off the edge that day. And it's just really hard. And that's something that's really hard to break, but people don't understand how their actions have a larger impact. And that's something that really needs to be addressed. And I've been doing a lot of work with schools and stuff about that. And it's a hard thing to do because it's such an ingrained thing in our society. Um, listening to your story, of course, it's like chilling from start to finish. You know, I not want to discredit anything that happened to you or what you went through. But listening to your story and hearing you talk about the bullying for some reason, just I think... <laughs> It, it just hit me differently. Obviously, everything is unnecessary. And like you said, the best thing would be just for none of it has happened and for you to not have gone through it. But hearing, I mean, I, you know, bull, bullying is, is a, it's a huge issue. Many think it's like an epidemic. I, I, I have been bullied. I go to schools. I give uh, talks to schools about anti-bullying. And so it's, it's very prevalent. Like it happens. And I think but there was something about your experiences with it where I was like, how can this be real? Like just for you to have gone through what you went through and then go to school and then experience this from your peers. Like I just, there was a huge question mark for me. And like, <laughs> I, I felt how like that I, all happened? I wanted answers. I was like, who are these kids? Like, <laughs> it wasn't just the kids. Like, was, yeah, yeah. There's the parent, the parents or the teachers too. Like I got an instant with a gym teacher. So. Like we'd have to go to gym and I have a phobia of men now. I'm kind of terrified of men, you know, Understand that's my deep, dark secret. I'm scared of men because of what happened to me and whatnot, especially when I was younger, like kind of going through purity and whatnot. So I was really kind of self-conscious of myself and I really didn't feel comfortable being in the change room and whatnot, like kind of that kind of stuff. Well, I had a gym teacher who she would force me to go to gym. She would like forced me to change and stuff. So I stopped bringing my gym clothes. So I didn't want to change with everybody else. So she tried to force me to wear gym clothes that they'd found in the lost and found. 
and she would try and force me. And eventually I wouldn't just come to school because I couldn't deal with that. And she didn't care that, you know, I felt uncomfortable. She said, you know, you have to do it. So you're coming to the school. You have to do it. I don't care about your feelings or, you know, what you went through. You're in gym class. And that was just something that really struggled with me. But how kids and stuff do that is do kids pick on kids like and they learn that from their parents from their teachers and I'm it's so kinda, happy it's a pure thing I'm so happy you said that because that I was I was gonna make that point is that to me it's something I think at times you hear at home or your influence yeah. like it's you know it's true what they say like we're not born to hate evil yeah, yeah oh yeah we're, we're not, not born, born evil. evil exactly um, and so it's just, and it's a great example of you, you know, if you're a nice person, you don't know what you can do for someone else in their day. Like yeah. it's going to be the smallest thing. It's the smallest thing that matters. Um, in, in today, today, like in life now, um, what are some things that you struggle with? Uh, so some of the things I struggle with day to day now has been, I still don't sleep very much. I'm lucky to get three to four hours of sleep a night, like uninterrupted rest. It's a little bit harder right now because I got a three month old. So that's always causes issues. But <laughs> uh, like I've struggled a lot, especially with depression. I've been diagnosed with chronic depression, PTSD. And I've done a lot with being able to deal with my issues especially in around my mental health, I've been able to deal with my PTSD, understand triggers, warnings, stuff like that. I've gotten my depression basically under control and I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of support set up, a lot of support networks, people. Uh, I've got everything I need in case like something does trigger me, something does happen. I've got supports, I've got people there that everything I can rely on. And I've set this network up over the last 10 years now. It's been slowly putting this network together as a safety net to where I can, you know, functional, have a functional life with dealing with everything. But one of the hardest things I had to deal with has been my night terrors, especially now that I've been in a relationship for a few years now, we got a child and whatnot, but trying to deal with the night terrors has been the biggest thing because I don't know when they strike or how it happens, but they do. And that can be really draining on a relationship so that's something I've had to work on and work on my sleeping habits and whatnot and it's slowly been coming around I if we can just um kind of talk about PTSD for a moment just because it's um very misunderstood like people think PTSD they think uh veterans and war and yeah. um that kind of thing and PTSD, PTSD can happen to anybody uh, it's it's just how you react to trauma in the moment. Like it's different. It's also different for yep. everybody. Like this, it's not kind of as cookie cutter as people think. And I also have PTSD. And the the night terrors are probably one of the most difficult uh, symptoms to manage and control because they are so unpredictable. Yep. And one thing that I struggle with is I will attack myself in my sleep. And so it's like it's and it's something. Cause you know, people think a night terror. Okay. So you have them in the night, but it's not about that. You, it, you know, you, I, for me, at least you have them, but then there's, you process it for, uh, I process mine for a long time after, cause there's shame. And then you're trying to understand it. And I, you know, I've gone to the optometrist so many times because I scratch my eye uh, during the attack. And so it's, it's, it's something that can easily, I find consume you in, in yeah. your waking life. It's, it's a lot to deal with, and it's a lot about understanding what they are and how your body reacts to them. Because when it comes to PTSD, in my case, being a child who's gone through that trauma, it can turn into CPTSD, which is Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, and that's what I've been basically labeled with. So I've gotten labeled with PTSD, as, and then it's kind of become complex, especially with dealing with a lot of the things I do nowadays. And just kind of understand it and like trying to work through how it happens, why they happen and try and look at it from an outside perspective to yourself. And like, you got to look at yourself also as the, the younger person who went through that trauma. So what I've had to do is, especially with some of the nightmares and stuff that I've had in the night terrors, 
like the reactions with the night terrors is I got to understand is I can't be hard on myself and that I look at that happen to a 10 year old child. Now being an adult now, would I go to a 10 year old child smart and not be like, you know, that never can happen. You know, that'll never, do you tell a 10 year old child that? No, you try and comfort them. You try and tell them everything's going to be all right. And you have to do that with yourself. That's a really big thing I found is being able to be nicer to yourself is would you with your trauma would you lash out and be negative the way you do to yourself or would you do that to a 10 year old or to however old you were when you went through that traumatic experience and that really catches a lot of people off guard because you know a lot of people don't think about it that way you got to basically deal with your inner child or your inner teenager from when that point happened and I found that helped out a lot with also understanding. Yes, I still have the nightmares and the night terrors that I deal with, but I'm able to process them a little bit better after I kind of collect myself, waking up from them and try and like make, calm myself down, walk myself through steps. And then that helps in the end. But a lot of people don't do that because a lot of people don't think about it that way. Do you find that it makes you the most grateful for the good moments? It does. I've had a lot of a lot of terrible moments in my life, a lot of low spots. I ended up in the mental health ward on my birthday from a suicide attempt because I had to have an absolutely terrible couple of months leading up to my birthday when I was, I think, turned 21 or 22. And then you look at it now versus me being 26 and, you know, the family and stuff, you'd be Become very grateful for the little things that you do have for the small comforts and for the person who's kind of stuck with you and it can at times it can get very clouded on the, the good things and the bad things to kind of all mix together and it comes this really hard soup to go through and it's and once you actually get everything kind of settled that makes you more appreciative of, of the good people and the good things that you've gone through so that's kind of the point of life is if you got those things in life that make you happy or that, you know, make you proud to be who you are, you got to work towards those. Because unfortunately, there's not going to be as many as the times that you're the bad times, the, you know, the moments you're not proud of yourself, those defeats that you have, you got to work towards those. I wanted to ask you about what quality of life meant to you, because I, I love talking about quality of life with people only because people who don't have trauma and who are neurotypical and just th- those people, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're like quality of life. That's something I've never considered. And I'm like, I hate you. Um, <laughs> so quality of life for me is kind of been, kind of been that like, uh, end of the rainbow kind of thing like the gold pot at the end of the rainbow or you know the nice beautiful you know summer vacation where you end up at the beach when it's not raining you know it's nice and sunny you can actually enjoy it. it's been one of those kind of things but never have happened well never have happened up to you a point in my life so before then I was always dealing with things I've never I was living to survive I was trying to survive what I went through. I was dealing with survivor's guilt. You know, why me? I never really looked at like what life could be. And it took me a long time to figure out that life can't be perfect. There's never going to be a perfect life, a happy life or anything like that. So you need to find where life makes you happy kind of where things are comfortable for you so I always described it as kind of a tunnel you're going through a tunnel after what happened to you your life basically turns into a tunnel you'll there's an end of the tunnel but you got two choices either you sit there in self-pity and never make it anywhere or you get up and you try to find the end you try and find the light at the end of the tunnel you're going to have your ups and your downs you're going to have a lot more downs than ups but you'll eventually find that end. And that's where you're going to find where life is the most comfortable for you. You're never going to have like the perfect life after dealing with this kind of trauma and stuff like that, but you can find a life where you're happy, where you want to get up, where you want to be a part of people's lives. 
yes, you still have to deal with the stigmas, the depressions, the struggles with all that kind of stuff, but yet you can still have a life worth living. Won't be a best the best life out there. It won't be like these super model shows and whatnot, but it'll still be a life worth having for you. And that is a very important message because I, as as part of my advocacy, I help people with peer support and mental health coaching. And one thing, it, I think ex- expectations is what I want to focus on for a minute because often I have people who start, you know, just started taking medication for depression and anxiety. And then they come to me and they're, and they're, they're panicked because they have a bad day. And yep. it's like, you, it's almost, you have to remind people or, or I think it's just marketed wrong how it works, <laughs> which is, you know, medications are, aren't to give you like 100%, 10 stars out of 10 stars every single day. Life is life. No. Like there are ups and downs. Exactly. And that's like a big struggle. Like I've dealt with that too, with a lot of people taking medications as all of a sudden they start taking it for a week and they're like, my life still sucks. I, I'm supposed to be better. Like it takes time. <laughs> And lots of time. And just so anyone listening to like, I, you know, I've been receiving treatment and care and extensive medical support team for years and years and years. And, and because I think with social media too, right, you have this idea of people like, oh, yep, they're doing- this fake. Yeah. And I always try to keep it as real as I can. But even that, you know, I it's, it's, it's just a lot, but just a reminder that despite, you know, having uh, disabilities and chronic illness and mental health disorders, I am functioning like the best that I can, but I still have days where I go to my partner and I'm like, life is worth living. Like, I need you to remind me that (laughs) that life is worth living. You have those struggles and I've had those a lot as well. And it's, it's a hard thing to deal with because yes, you see all these people on social media, their lives are all perfect. You know, they're the most fit bodies. They're, you know, going on these vacations. They're always happy and smiling while you're on the other end of that screen having an absolute terrible day. And you're like, why can't I have that? People need to kind of step back and, you know, look at what they have. They need to realize that, you know, life's gonna be a basket full of crappy days that's all it is you're gonna get the odd little good day as a reference to one of my favorite movies with ryan reynolds into it he says that life is just a terrible show with brief infomercials of happiness and that's how i see life you need to take those brief infomercials of happiness and take them for what they are and just think about those when you're dealing with that terrible show of your life and that's what a lot of people understand because from especially from what I noticed my last major episode of depression that I dealt with was almost 18 months I had a really bad go for 18 you got me B because I my mind that I just got over was 16 months (laughs) it was 18 months and from basically when I decided you know this is fucking enough I'm tired of this I marked the day and it took me over a year and a half it took me another 18 months to get to a point where I could say I'm done I'm out of this depression like I could say I'm back to a functioning person now it took me basically two three years from basically hitting a really bad low and not be and struggling with it and I tried everything from therapies to drugs to all sorts of different things before I finally kind of got myself to rhythm for that last one and I worked and worked hard on it and finally got myself out and I'm to a kind of happier point right now and I'm like a little cautious things are going a little too well at some points and it kind of makes me a little concerned because I'm like, nervous yeah. <laughs> where's the bad thing that's gonna happen because it's just like this last year or so has been fairly good I'm like this is kind of getting scary I'm oh like, my goodness so funny <laughs> but at the end it's also it's all the supports I worked on all the stuff I put together all my safety nets and like, I'm happy I haven't been on any antidepressants in almost two years now. So I'm happy with that. I'm happy I've gotten the support group I need. I've gotten a really phenomenal uh, forensic psychologist I talked to. And he is an amazing person. He's helped me basically since I was in my early teens. And he's helped me through a lot of these struggles and stuff like that. And it's kind of got, helped get me to this point. But I've also had a huge support group 
working with actually multiple agencies, multiple people, multiple programs from across the country. And now I'm kind of looking at like, I got to give back to, I got to help, you know, where I needed help. Now I got to help those people. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. You got you got help. Now you got to help out. That's how I, I look at it. I am really enjoying this time with you because I just, I, I love your company because it's, when you when you're with people who understand there's just a sense of like you, uh, you can almost like your shoulders drop and you just feel relaxed because people get it and i i think when i'm when i'm around people who don't get it it can feel like the most lonely thing yeah that's I, that's called the glass wall phenomenon okay and i i struggle with it a lot so up till actually my most recent podcast with uh, canadian true crime i'd actually struggle with trying to relate with another male individual who's went through what I did and how I see it is like I can I can relate with anyone who's gone through any huge, large trauma or sexual assault anything like that anyone with PTSD I can relate with and it's funny you'll start talking to them and you start talking about like you know how you always sit with your back to a wall in a restaurant so you can see all the exits and stuff like that and it's like it's amazing how you can relate but at the same time it's like I've always looked for someone who's gone through what I have so I could talk to someone I have, that's called the glass wall phenomenon because because how it feels is you're in a room you can see people you can wave at them you can kind of communicate but you can't physically be there there's a wall of glass in front of you you can see them you can wave at them but they're just not there with you and that's like the biggest thing I have and, and I've still struggled a lot with trying to you know find someone who's gone through similar to what I have so I can talk to them and like figure it out unfortunately there's next to no one who's made it as far as I have oh. and it's really sad it is sad it is because there's a lot of people who've gone through the trauma who's gone through this and they're not here today because they didn't have the family support they didn't have the peer support and it failed them and can you look at the suicide rates from it, the overdoses the drug use all the escapisms that people have trying to hide away their trauma when in the end it's they needed someone there to show them that you need to deal with it up front you need to deal with that really hard pain right at first and then it gets easier as it goes on but you for you to be able to do that you need to have a really big support and equity you need to have the friends you need to have the family and that's why I was very lucky to have the family I have they're all all my family are all redheads I've got four sisters who are all redheads. I'm the only boy. And <laughs> I've got my father and my mother. And my dad's been like the biggest supporter of me. And my mom dealt with a lot of basically survival skills. She's blaming herself for what happened. And it took a long time for her to get over. But she, it kind of wasn't under her, out of, it was out of her control when all that, that happened to me when I was 10. But she still blamed herself to this day. And you can see it when she looks at you. But she knows now that, like, yes, it was terrible what happened. But I'm able to help more people now than I would have if it never would have happened to me. And she's slowly being able to talk about it. Where my father, he's worked a lot with the Canadian Center for Child Protection and being a, you know, a forefront speaker on dealing with it. With His biggest story was always... It's called what no one harms way because it was an amber alert and an amber alert is a child in no one's harm no one harms way and he was a big advocate for that especially when i was in my early teens and stuff like that he was always out there uh, with the proper families preparing family with the proper background your child can make it you can have a decent life if you work for it and then i kind of taken the mantle from him and done a lot of my work now and a lot of my speaking events and I've gone across the country I've met with a lot of people a lot of people in powerful positions to help try and raise awareness for this and unfortunately with the people we have now in charge of our government is they're actually a very dead set against having that kind of peer support group the stuff for the victims rights and stuff like that they're making it easier for the uh, for the accused to get off where there's now nothing for the victims and it's really hard uh, uh, that's I'm, a whole nother cup of worms. 
on that topic, because you 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 are involved in a lot of organizations and advocacy work for uh, for many things, but specifically um, child welfare, ch ch and yeah, child welfare child and victims. Um, what are what are some things you think need to be improved? We need to have a better support network, especially for families and stuff got going through traumatic events like that gone through stuff like that there needs to be more done to protect the family's rights and to put the people the accused away we need to stop giving these guys 10 12 chances as you look at the individual mr whitmore he's been to prison i think like 10 to 12 times before this and he was released early because good behavior and stuff like that and he's free he's reoffended every time upon release so we need to like start looking at this we need to start putting more money into child advocacy groups because we got basically nothing here in Canada. There's an uh, up and coming group I know of in Winnipeg. I think they call themselves the Snowflakes, which is a terrible name, but <laughs> they're working on it. And that's, I know the person who's heading it up, and she's an amazing person. Her name's Chris Dakowitz, but we need more organizations like that. We need a better support networks. We need better funding. We need funding to give the families after all this. Because it was hard for my father to go back to work and for my mom she couldn't go back to work after what happened she ended up having to homeschool us so we're reliant on one person and that whole kind of three four week month long window where all this has happened it's like there's a huge financial drain on the family so you got then you got to look at stuff like counseling and stuff like that you got to see special psychologists stuff like that so the federal government gave me eleven hundred dollars when it all happened, said, this is all you get. This will fucking save you, cure you, you're your way you go. And that was it. So $1,100. But so to go see someone like my psychologist, like four or $500 an hour, let alone it's a four hour drive. I got to get a hotel room, stuff like that. So how far does $1,100 go? Not far at all. Exactly. And you need counseling for years. I was lucky that the Canadian Center for Child Protection stepped in and helped us out a lot, or else I wouldn't have been here. Because there was no way our family could afford to send me to do something like that to get the help I needed. Because it was out of our reach, and it's out of reach of many, many Canadians. Big props to that organization. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's, I've been, a, that's one of the biggest struggles as I see is that it needs to be able to be more accessible by all Canadians because we, I do a lot of work with Indigenous communities and it's absolutely appalling the conditions that a lot of these communities are in and their lack of resources and the lack of trust in people in them and it's really hard. Like there's some very hard-headed communities I've been in and working in the schools and it's, and there's nothing set up for them. They're set up for all these other, you know, pointless projects, but there's nothing set up for the child's mental health or for the, you know, the victim's health, the victim's rights. There's nothing set up and it's really hard to deal with. Um, for, I know, and I, I, you know, I'll, I'll be sure to email you this. Maybe you can send me, you'll think of more or different ones, different websites and resources um, for, families going through difficult times um off the top of your head you mentioned child center for or Canadian sorry. center for child protection yeah now that's a really hard one to remember they're <laughs> an international or, yeah international but easiest way especially if you're in older to remember the canadian center for child protection remember hockey in the 60s cccp russians Oh, yeah, like my big ongoing joke with things. The uh, Center for Child Protection is probably the largest agency we have right now in dealing with that. They're okay. a very busy agency, but they're a very important, prominent one when it comes to dealing with ongoing child sexual assault cases, all the internet stuff that's going on. They have a lot of outreach uh, numbers and stuff like that. They're a very good one to deal with. And there's a lot of smaller advocacy groups, like you have the Sheldon Kennedy Foundation and other stuff like that. And there's been a lot of work in trying to get everything kind of working together. But like I've got lists of resources that I have because I do do the odd crisis call and stuff like that. So I'll be, sure, I'll be sure to shoot you a note to grab that so I could put it in the description box for anyone who's interested. 
like there's the two one the mental health intro the 211.ca the kids help phone kids help phone.ca the lgbt youth health line the mental health helpline mental health helpline helpline <laughs> uh youth courts uh, suicide prevention lifeline e-health uh osi ptsd health and like i've got lists upon lists of different resources catered to different ethnic groups societies and whatnot and what's there because unfortunately each case is different and you have to have different tools for each person and that's why it's important to have these experts like daniel rothman and you know christy dakowitz and these other people who know where to put know where to take the person and send them to the right help and that's the biggest thing see like I wouldn't be able to help a single person without any of these organizations to help me. So it's a very crucial and important thing. Thank you so much for everything you do. That's no worries. So I'm much happy respect. I'm able to help. Is there yeah, anything? You can't, you can't call me an amazing <laughs> regular individual who's gone through an extraordinary <laughs> thing. And I'm just able to help because that. so that's the biggest thing for me. I don't see myself as a hero. I don't see myself as an amazing person. I am just an ordinary person who went through some extremely unfortunate events. And I decided to pick myself up and try and live my life. And I'm going to try and help people get to that point. And that's just as I see. I can't stand people calling me a hero. I'm not one. I'm just someone who's here to help. That's the reason I'm a firefighter now. I'm I volunteer, I have a volunteer department I work on. I work as a wildland firefighter in the summer. As I enjoy helping, I'm not a hero. I just, an ordinary person putting myself in an extraordinary situation. That'll be the title of this podcast, Zachary Miller, ordinary person. <laughs> in an extraordinary situation. An extraordinary situation. Um, before we say goodbye, is there anything I missed or anything you would like to add or share? Well, if anyone wants to reach out to me, they can get a hold of you through your podcast. And then Absolutely. They can, you can connect me through email or whatnot mm -hmm. and I will talk to anybody about any issues anyone who needs help if they want to reach out to me about their problems the things they see or just need someone to relate to I'm always by my phone I'm always happy to talk to people and I said I'm always out there I'm always willing to help so feel free to reach out to me awesome thank you so I much Zach no. thank you no worries all right, everybody, thank you so much. And so much thanks to Zach, ordinary person in an ex extraordinary situation. That's your new tagline. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much, everybody. We will see you on the next one.